you see on screen before you some bicycle pictures. Notice that they are all very similar, like that. You got a wheel here and a wheel here and a crossbar because it's a male. And then you've got another crossbar here for stability. You've got a, a crossbar here to attach the wheel and a crossbar here to attach the wheel. You have a seat, you have handlebars, and then what you can't see as well are the speed controls that are on the handlebars. Okay, typical bicycle. This is an older bicycle from about the 19, early 1900s, and you'll notice it also has two wheels, and the seat is way up front, and you can't really see the handlebar. You got another wheel there, and another crossbar. So it's a fair statement to say that this bicycle and this bicycle are related. But you'll also notice that there are certain really big differences between this bicycle and this bicycle. In particular, this particular crossbar is in this bicycle. All right. And we got a very different handlebar here. Okay. Here, that crossbar is missing, missing, missing. So if you were to try to claim that this bicycle gave birth eventually over the eons, evolutionarily, to this bicycle, in order to prove that, you would have to account for how this bicycle and the Neo-Darwinian version of the theory, in the Neo-Darwinian version of the theory, everything needed to create this bicycle from this bicycle is already in this bicycle. Okay, and that it just needs to mutate in order to become this bicycle. Okay, so how does this bicycle become this bicycle when you got this extra crossbar here? All right, because there's only two here. There's one here and one here. Two, two wheels, two crossbars. Here. There are one, two, three extra crossbars. Because you've got, these are shorter, here and here. Okay, well you can say, well, if this got longer and longer and longer and longer, and then broke off, and then reassembled, then you could maybe get this. Okay, but bearing in mind that a gene is an instruction set on how to make something. What kind of changes have to happen in the genes to produce longer and longer of these? And then, here's the important point, they have to break off and reassemble like this. How does the instruction set for this which obviously has a certain length in mind here, and just two become this, which is suddenly now three more, and these two are shorter. How does that occur naturally? Naturally. What evidence is there that this changed by itself into this. There's no evidence. I know I'm using a man-made thing, but pretend they're not man-made. Okay? This is a structure. It has its own, as it were, life and viability and everything else. This is a structure which is obviously very similar. Okay? But this is a very different thing and of course, I, I haven't even talked about the speed controls, because there are no speed controls on this. There's only a brake. I'm not even sure there's a brake in that style, but pretend. All right? There are speed controls here. Well, if there's no speed control at all here, 
how does it come in here? So even if we cross the first hurdle of how does all these extra pieces of metal come in from this design now? It's basically tantamount to disassembling this, disassembling, and then reconfiguring these bars to get this. This is substantially more metal. So you have so this would have to grow longer first. Then somehow the whole bike, the whole organism, would have to be disassembled. Of course, the wheel would have to shrink. All right. And then it would have to be disassembled and then put this there. And then as far as the speed controls go, well, there are no speed controls here at all. So where are the instructions inherent in this organism to create the speed controls that are right here? Because remember, neo-Darwinian evolution requires everything to come from this in order for this more advanced form to be produced. How is that possible? Because all the material here doesn't include, first of all, enough metal. And it doesn't include anything with respect to the speed controls at all. So where does it come from? And of course, I'm not mentioning like this. I'm leaving this out. There's nothing that that there either, see? This is the inherent problem of neo-Darwinian evolution. It's saying that the earlier produces the later. Okay, but the earlier doesn't have anything in the gene set that can produce this or this or even this. All that is new. And Darwinians are going to argue that the genes have mutated. Mutated from what? See, Darwin himself allowed for external forces to have a bigger play in adding to the structure here, to get to here. But the neo-Darwinian position doesn't. It's restricting everything to gene changes. OK, fine. What makes the genes change from within themselves to produce something that wasn't there before like this? and like this, and like this, not to mention the fact that this would have to be disassembled. This has to shrink. And you can say, OK, well, this shrinks, and therefore this disassembles. OK, but it's dead then. You realize that. And then it magically combines to result in this, with this is new, this is new, and all this extra metal is new. How can that happen? Now, Neil Darwinian, you know, hypothesis, this is just with respect to two obviously similar things. And this is obviously earlier in time. We can establish that historically, of course, to get to this, which is obviously a, a, a modern bicycle. OK, but they, the Darwinians go even farther. They basically say, that these bicycles birthed Ferraris. Considering that man is at the top of the food chain so far as we know, then we're the Ferrari. Now look at the differences between a bicycle, which has two wheels, very simple structure, bare frame, even this one, and a Ferrari. A Ferrari now has all this extra metal as a skin. Oh, I love these cars. Okay, they have all these extra metal as skins. All right, they have four wheels instead of just two. Okay, they have glass. They have, you know, a hood over it. And of course, the biggest thing that a Ferrari differs from a bicycle is underneath this beautiful hood here, I think it's in the front, is an engine. You see any engine anywhere here? Where's the gene that can possibly mutate into an engine? 
because this thing is driven by an external force. So how does it become part of the internal? Where's the engine? Where's any kind of gene set that can remotely mutate into an engine? See the point? And of course, and I haven't even covered the other things like doors. You can see how all these Ferraris are mutations. You could argue, assuming that they weren't man-made, okay? You could argue that every one of these Ferraris, any one of them probably came from, uh, where's this one? Okay, you could say that this is the probable progenitor for the rest of them. That looks even more like a Mustang. I, I don't remember enough about, uh, there's an older one. Okay? You can argue that these are all related and can be propagated by mutation. Because they all have the same essential structures. Different shapes and all the rest of it. All right? So you could say, if you were calling it evolution, which is not the right term, that all these Ferraris are evolutions, but they're not an evolution of the bicycle. There's no way they can be. Too many missing parts. No instruction set that's even nascent. And how can a gene mutate out of nothing? Because that's what you have to buy. If you're a Darwinian evolutionist, you have to buy that a gene can mutate out of nothing, especially neo-Darwinian. Darwin himself allowed for external forces, but the neo-Darwinians are cutting that stuff out. Okay. Show me how a bicycle can become a Ferrari. I mean, that's an engineering question. If I, if I put Microsoft Paint on here, I could draw... I could draw a bicycle. I could draw a bicycle. I could take it apart. I could change the wheels. I could add bars to get this. I could draw it. And you would see the engineering changes, therefore, that had to take place for that to occur. But no amount of drawing and messing around with this diagram, pretending that this is the instruction set of the genes. No amount of messing around is going to result in any one of these cars. So there's no way that a Ferrari came from a bicycle. Okay, there's also no way that man came from an ape. Or any other kind of combination you want to mention. It's not possible. There are too many design changes that have to occur. And you're always introducing externals from nothing. If you're going to stay with Darwinian theory, you're going to have to introduce externals from within the organism. So they're not externals, they're all internal. And if you're going to introduce externals and then say that the organism mutated from itself, well, that's either intellectually dishonest or contrary to your own theory. Take your pick. See, this is why I'm against the Darwinian thing, as elegant as it is. Okay, this is a really elegant look. Isn't that, isn't that gorgeous? Ah, love these cars. But there's no way they came from bicycles. There's no way man came from a lower life form. It's that much of a difference between that and that. Too much difference, too much extra material. Where'd it come from? Because it can't come from this, ever. That's the problem of evolution. Bicycles can't become Ferraris.